Telecast, the TV industry news review. In the age of OTT, what's the future for satellite TV? And I get the inside story on the new documentary film, Finding Jack Charlton. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, my guests are Alistair Tom, CEO of Freesat, Stuart Thompson, editor of Digital TV Europe, and Gabriel Clark, TV broadcaster, journalist, and director of Finding Jack Charlton. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. So all the talk over the past year has been about cord cutting, streamers, AVODs, and how many new SVOD services will consumers shell out for. But what about good old satellite TV? What's its role in the market now and in the future? Well, here to discuss that and much more, I'm joined by CEO of Freesat, Alistair Tom, and Stuart Thompson, editor of Digital TV Europe. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to be here. Great to have you on the show. Alistair, coming to you first. For those who aren't aware, can you talk us through Freesat and what Freesat is and what Freesat offers? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I think Freesat is a really great, diverse platform. It combines the best of television viewing in terms of free-to-air television um, with some of the biggest on-demand players, both in the UK and internationally. I think this is great because we have over 180 channels. There's an awful lot of choice. It's incredibly easy to set up. And we feel that um, we are really doing a great job at keeping PSBs in people's minds, but also recognising that people want to watch a little bit of on-demand content as well. So you say 180 different channels are available to people. Is it only in the UK? Is it only available to UK viewers? We fundamentally provide satellite television just to UK homes. Um, we actually have a another sort of white label offering that we provide to a company in Ireland called RTE. And we also have a white label offering, which is actually on an aerial, a DTT offering to homes in Spain through a company called Lovers TV. It was recently announced that you're merging with Freeview, which is the other free-to-air service in the UK. And I know you can't say too much about that due to regulatory issues and uh, merger issues, but can you give us a little bit of the rationale behind that move? The proposed merger is between the DUK and Freesat, um, not Freeview. That's a sort of separate business, albeit DUK controls some of it. For me, I think this is a really good move forward. As we've seen a lot in the papers, there's been a lot of stuff about how the public sector broadcasters need to work better together and that the PSBs are finding it harder to maintain prominence compared to some uh, more expensive global players. And so therefore, I think bringing together organisations and then strengthening our free-to-air offering in the UK can only be a good thing. I'm really excited about what the future holds and I think that Freesat brings an awful lot potentially to that you know we're a really nimble company we've become a completely vertical business so we design make and build our set-top boxes and we go through do our own content deals all the way through to actually having our own shop so we've got an e-commerce site the DUK business through Freeview Play is really ubiquitous across television sets And I think the combination of those two could be really, really exciting for UK customers. Because actually, let's remember, this should be something that is really good for customers in the end. Essentially, so what you'll have is more choice, more free-to-air content accessible by both OTT and by satellite. Is that fair to say? It's hard to know exactly what the detail will be, Justin, but I hope that the end will be more content, better availability, better prominence, better quality UXs, and a better free-to-air offering. Yeah. Right. Okay. And will you rebrand, do you think? Will there be a rebranding process? That's a really good question. So I don't know that at the moment. I think it's a really difficult thing to know because both Freesat and Freeview brands are strong and recognized in their own rights. Branding is really important to the target audience or the target market you're going to 
and I'm sure people who know more about marketing, branding and hierarchies will be able to um, give better advice on what that needs to be in the future. I know, I'm not sure at the moment that would make sense. Okay, well, well, we'll keep our eye on that. Stuart, welcome to the show. We've all read about huge increases in viewing and subscriptions on the big US SVOD services over the past year or so. Have we reached peak SVOD yet, do you think? No, I don't think we have. I think um, SVOD's still growing. Obviously, the big studios are really putting their marketing power behind their own services. And there's, uh, you know, when you're talking about Netflix, Disney Plus and Amazon Prime, those are obviously the big ones, but there's a bunch of other niche ones as well that are coming along. And I think there's no end in sight really to growth in SVOD. People talk about a limit to how much people are willing to spend and you end up possibly with a bigger bill. If you have too many SVODs in your portfolio of services, a bigger bill than you would have had with, you know, top end pay TV. But then there's, you know, you've got to think also that a lot of these SVOD services are expand, still expanding globally. They're differentiating their uh, their prices and targeting sort of different segments in different ways by having mobile only sort of packages in some territories and you know finding a way to do that i think svod is the business model that that really still makes the most sense for streaming we hear a lot about advertising supported services and those are definitely have a place but i think um svod still got some way to go you recently published your digital tv europe industry survey and it's a it's a really a super piece of words lots of detail in there but as an overview, what have there been the major shifts that you've seen in the last 12 months that you think have, have changed things forever in terms of the digital TV landscape? A lot of these trends have been happening for for a long time. I think certainly the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic where everybody's a bit home, there's been a, a well-documented sort of upsurge in take-up of streaming services by consumers. And um, so a lot of the, the shifts have been accelerated to some extent during the last year or so because people have been at, at home. But I think the long term trends that we see from the survey and the survey really is, is a survey of industry insiders. It's not a consumer survey. It's a survey of sort of industry executives who read our publication show that, you know, there's growth in live streaming. Um, which has been added to SVOD. So live streaming is something that is growing hugely. It still has some technical challenges, but a lot of those are are being overcome. There's a shift in general to IP-based distribution um, because it makes sense for people, for broadcasters and media companies to have one technology to deliver to all devices and platforms where where people consume or watch video, um, not have separate, infrastructures for you know broadcast and and, and streaming to to as, to as much an extent as possible and that, that that makes sense um and then you know you have also a growth in other things like piracy for example there is, there is a bigger threat from piracy because now all content is on the internet there's there's like you have movies that are being released straight away on the internet so it's easier to pirate those and um, pirate services are adopting ip and becoming global uh, in the same way that streaming services are so the, the threat there is, is quite big all of these shifts are really um you know well established now but i think they've definitely been accelerated by by the pandemic piracy is actually something that uh, we should probably focus on as separate because it's such a big issue and it sounds like it's it's getting bigger Looking at all of these new services that are launching, and, and this is something we've we've touched on before on, on the show, search and aggregation are two you know, really current buzzwords when it comes to user experience on, on digital TV. Can you explain a little bit about what aggregation really means and why it's so important for the future of all of these services? Well, aggregation really is is one of the other big trends uh, that really come out in the survey, and it's probably one I should have mentioned <laughs> just in the right at the start. But basically, when you're talking about aggregation, you're talking about platform operators. So that could be a pay TV operator like Sky. It could be a cable company or a, or a telecom company with a, with a, a presence in people's homes. In the past, a lot of these um, companies have packaged their own services 
they've acquired rights and built a pay TV offering. Now, typically, they're becoming what what what's been called super aggregators. So they're building app stores or using platforms such as Android TV to access the Google App Store and package that as part of their own offering, um, or or another plat or other platforms that offer app stores, um, and basically aggregate a lot of third party services. So Netflix, Disney Plus, all the ones we mentioned, plus plus other services, and Obviously, if you're doing that, if you're not basing your TV offering on your own acquired rights and your own exclusivity of, of content, you're really aggregating all sorts of other services, you have to offer something else. And that really is search and discovery. So search and, and universal discovery of content, offering people tools to to find the content they want from all these services um, and find it in a way that makes sense for them is, is really the new battleground. We would see ourselves as an aggregator, Stuart, and I think you're totally right because we sort of have these services like Netflix and Amazon, as well as BBC iPlayer and ITU Hub. And as a customer, customers will struggle to find content they want. When there's a sea of content available, how do you get it surfaced up? Because what hasn't changed is that often people sit down and want to get to television quickly and be able to just watch something. And they don't want to be able to hold in their mind every show they've got on every different player. And I think that's where platforms like us can, and aggregators can really add value to people because you can have a home screen where you promote those things. And using viewing data like we do, we actually can get to know our customers well and actually promote stuff that is relevant to them. And so I think there's an area there which is good for customers. So in a sea of choice, you actually find things that are more relevant to you. You can access Netflix through FreeSat. Is that right? Yep. You can access Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube, um, iPlayer, ITV Hub. Right. Okay. Do those businesses like Netflix, do they pay you to be on your platform? I'm not sure it's totally appropriate for me, Justin, to be totally transparent about the commercial models we have with those providers. But there is a relationship where we're providing value to them. So we're bringing eyeballs and we are ensuring that people view their stuff and they do value that. Yes. So, Alistair, what's the future then for the set-top box? I mean, speaking personally, I've got Sky, BT, Roku, Apple TV, apps on my Samsung telly. So I've got all of this choice. I've got I've got no room on my uh, you know underneath my TV. No room left. And obviously, FreeSat is a box as well. What's the future for the set top box? Because I always thought my belief was really that TV is all going to be about apps, and it is now. And is it not going to be in the future? Is it everything isn't presumably just going to move to apps? That's a difficult question in some ways because I think that's something that a lot of people in especially central London, in our sector, talking about. To give you UK versus the rest of the world is a little bit different. But in the UK, the drug of the PVR is incredibly popular. And that's thanks to Sky for many years. So people really, really enjoy recording shows and being able to record multiple shows, have series links, and have a sort of almost a watch list of things ready for them to view. That still is incredibly popular in the UK. That requires a... Um, set-top box and so we provide that there are some people absolutely who just want to watch television and they buy television and you can buy free sat enabled televisions as well so we have arrangements with samsung lg and certainly the biggest television manufacturers in the world it is really interesting discussion going forward because a lot of people take the view that thanks to the world of players and apps as you talk about an ip that actually the ability to stream will reduce the need to record because obviously you don't lose your show. So you can go straight into iPlay, for example, if you miss a show and download it, watch it. And on one level, that kind of intuitively makes sense. What we're seeing, though, isn't quite that at the moment. So we still see some of our customers being incredibly keen on recordings. So I guess in summary, I think over the long period of time, we will see a divergence in the way people use devices but I think the set-top box here is is here to stay for quite some time. The other thing I would say about set-top boxes is that their processing power is often more powerful than televisions, and they're easier to update. So we can update our software whenever we want. And that 
traditionally hasn't been quite the case with television manufacturers, where their desire to update them over time um, reduces because obviously ultimately they want you to buy more televisions. Okay. And Stuart, I think I read in your report that pay TV, and, and I think that, you know, it's very easy, I suppose, for us to think, okay, it's all about SVODs now, particularly when we're thinking with my sort of content industry head on, they're the new players, they've got all the money, they're making the, the flashy Q shows. But but realistically, pay TV is still a lot bigger, isn't it, when it comes to combined SVODs in terms of revenue generation around the world? One of our, our sister companies uh, is Omnia Research, and they, they recently did a, a report, which I think we'll maybe we'll talk about briefly, um, which showed that SVOD uh, is growing fast, but pay TV in terms of revenue is still is still very much bigger and will be for, for some time. I think, you know, when you're talking about SVOD, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of differentiated pricing in different markets. Um, some of the services, uh, the price of these services is going up. If you look at pay TV overall um, globally, uh, the, the revenue pie for pay TV is still much bigger and, and would probably will be for some time. Yeah, Alistair, your offer is pretty compelling because it's free essentially. A free is a compelling price for TV. Do you expect to see a large growth in demand for the free sat service as the real effect of the pandemic makes itself known? We don't know how the economy is going to play out quite yet because we're, we're still starting to ease up in the UK. Obviously, still many countries around the world are still in a sort of fairly strict lockdown, but we still don't really know how the economy is going to play out over the next year, 18 months. But, you know, are you, are you set for a big increase in, in customers, do you think? I mean, obviously, I'm going to say yes. I guess I think that for two reasons. Two side different. I think one is, I think, the uncertainty in the economy uh, will always make people look at what they're paying for, what services they're paying for, and whether they are getting true value for money for that. And I think pay TV always comes under challenge when it's in those two times and the, the reason is that often people pay especially the ba- more basic tiers they pay for a tier of television but actually they find that the vast majority of what they watch is free to air you know so if you think about the bigger shows like whether it be great british bake off or strictly or things like that they're all free to view and so i think that is good for us i think the second thing that's good for us is actually people's viewing habits are changing and what they want to watch is changing. So I think people's attitudes are that I want to pay for what I want to watch. And that's why I think SVODs and on-demand players have been so popular, because people are feeling that they can pay for something they choose to pay for. And if they don't want to pay for it anymore, they will stop paying for it. That's what we call the hybrid model. And I think that's the fastest growing model in the the UK. And, And our our offering is exactly in that area. So I guess for those two reasons, I feel very positive about the future for FreeSat. As I say, I'm a Sky subscriber. I only really watch Sky for the football. If Sky lost the football, for example, yeah, exactly. <laughs> would I, which is the big question, right? Um, if Sky were to lose the football, I'd say, okay, I'm not interested in more. I cancel Sky. Can I access FreeSat through my Sky set-top box? No, you can't. Unfortunately, you would have to buy a FreeSat enabled device. We offer those on our website and there's a range of pricing, so they can be very competitive. We also um, offer payment plans so that um, you don't have to pay for it all up front. What we do find with a lot of our customers who are ex-Sky customers is it is as simple as taking your old Sky box out and plugging a new one in. And I think, yeah, no, I think the football is a, a really good example that if you're in football, absolutely Sky is a, it provides a really good offering for that for people who want to watch Premiership. If that were to change in the future, then I suspect that, yeah, people may change their views on things. And now it's time in the show for my guests to choose their TV industry story of the week that's caught their attention over the past seven days. Alistair, what's your story of the week? Um, so my story of the week is about Motherland being remade for US audience and for people who kind of don't know much about it it's essentially a show that follows this uh, the I guess the trials and tribulations of London parents whether it be for 
um, their, how they manage their careers and childcare, etc. Um, and that's probably been exacerbated even more in COVID in a lot of people's minds. The reason I picked it out was I thought it's quite interesting, I guess, for a couple of reasons. One, that it shows quite how popular UK content is and exportable. And it's really interesting to see that British shows with a very sort of what we feel, especially comedy ones, British comedy being remade in the States. I guess the most famous example is in more recent times is The Office, which was really successful in America. There's a load of other shows that are sort of happening. And I think what's interesting is that it's probably been exacerbated a bit by COVID and the need for more content. Uh, FreeSat, it's a kind of, it's something we're looking at at the moment because there's a very perennial debate of remakes, what's the best, the original, um, and whether it works better in the UK or not. And we're doing some research and hopefully we'll share some findings in time with you guys about that. Stuart, what about you? What's your story of the week? My story, I think we, we touched on this actually a little bit earlier, and I'm going to be a bit sort of straight and data-led on, on my story because it was it was a story we wrote based on Omdia's research, Omdia's our sister brand, which which is a research house, which touches on what we, we, we've just been talking about, which is streaming was going to account for all subscriber growth globally um, over the next five years, but pay TV will still dominate revenue. But I think they, the, the key takeaway from, from that story is that you know there's going to be about half a billion additional streaming subs added to the, the, the existing stock of them for, over the next five years up to 2025. And all the growth really in pay video is going to come from that, even though pay TV is still going to dominate revenue. And I think it, it's quite an inter- interesting report that they put together because one of the other findings was also that the the three big streamers, uh, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, and of course Netflix, are still going to be dominant players. They're going to account for a very large chunk of of that streaming pie globally. Um, and I think it's just really kind of an indication of what's happening. The kind of globalization of media distribution and, and the kind of vertical integration that, that's happening. It, it's kind of, it makes me think about when, uh, you know, the early years of the 20th century, when, when movie distribution became kind of vertically integrated and Hollywood dominated movies and movie distribution through a kind of vertical integration process and owning the means of distribution as well. And it's, it's something similar, really, that, that, that we're seeing. No, it's a fascinating time, that's for sure. And now it's time in the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they want to tell to get in the bin. Stuart, who's your hero of the week? Well, I was thinking about this and I decided I would choose DAZN, the, the sports streaming service. They recently did an exclusive deal on Syria A, was their uh, the, the sort of most recent uh, news story. I think it's just they've come from an underdog status and, and really made waves in, in sports and sports rights. Um, it's a very tough market to to play in. I think you know you've got big players now entering it, like Amazon again, with dabbling their their toes in you know in, in different exclusive sports rights, um, and it's it's very tough to do. But I think DAZN have certainly shown that uh, there's there's a way forward with that, and they've acted as a very effective disruptor. I think they're a really interesting company, aren't they? They, I think that's a really interesting what they've done recently. And it, and you're totally right; it will, it might well change the way football rights are distributed going forward. They've set themselves up as the Netflix of sports, if you like. So you know, I've had lots of discussions about you know Sky's dominance in in football over the last few years, and you know, are Netflix going to make a play? Obviously, Amazon Prime now are involved in football. And you would think, well, why doesn't the Premier League launch its own SVOD service? They've obviously been looking at execs with TV experience, not only for rights, but you know, surely that would be Premier League flicks or some, <laughs> or some sort of service like that, surely would. I guess the offsetting argument, Justin, is that every time there's been a rights renewal in the UK, Particularly, there's always been a discussion of who's going to enter and new company, and it's all going to be completely different. And to date, it's been remarkably similar every time, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Well, that lure of guaranteed cash coming through the door for uh, for the Premier League is obviously something that is is pretty compelling. I think they also do a great job on the production and stuff like that. So it's, it's not just about that. They do. Yeah, yeah, the no. money is it? It's a wider, it's a wider offering. I think it's also very easy to come unstuck because the, the league one is found in France, where they uh, they 
sort of did a deal with media pro the spanish uh yeah production company and, and that went very very wrong so it, it's 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 something you want you have to think carefully about and you end up in, in a lot of trouble yeah this is true this is true how about you alistair who's your hero of the week okay my hero of the week slightly different i went with chocolate and i guess i went right. for a couple of reasons <laughs> i went one because we just had easter and everyone loves chocolate right two i think it's something i was thinking about that it's a really positive thing because especially in the moment, it kind of brings people and generations together. You know, when you think about people doing egg hunts and stuff like that. And at the moment, it's also quite a good way to remember to say thanks to people and um, by giving them chocolates or to remind you about your relatives. So I think for me, that's why it's my hero of the week, albeit probably not totally TV focused. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. All right. And what about uh, get in the bin? Who or what are you throwing in the bin, Alistair? I thought I'd throw in the bin poor Wi-Fi. It's the bane of my life. In the world where I now live through a screen and have an infinite amounts of meetings every day, quite often I have my children at home as well, also doing online schooling and everything else. It has been a, a massive impediment. It's a massive source of frustration. Yeah, absolutely. When your screen freezes and, you know, you're pulling a face and you're there for like five minutes in in limbo when everybody else is uh, is saying, uh, oh, look, you know, so-and-so's frozen. In an uncomplimentary way. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. How about you, Stuart? Who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Um, I'm going to go a little bit political, Justin. I'm going to throw Brexit in the bin. I think it's just, it seems to be the gift that keeps on giving for bad stuff. I think we've seen it recently in northern ireland this week uh, just the upsurge of violence that's related to that but uh, i think also it's just been a bit of a total disaster for the uk broadcasting industry which really was you know the center of european international broadcasting and uh, that's kind of been severely damaged by it yeah well i'm sure we'll Put, have our focus a little bit more back on Brexit once that you know we get to the summer. Sadly, <laughs> we'll be talking about Brexit <laughs> again probably once COVID is hopefully behind us. Listen, thank you so much, Alistair and Stuart, for coming on the show. Really enjoyed having you on the show. We could talk about so many different things about pay TV and and FreeSat and uh, satellite TV as a whole. But Alistair, good luck with your merger. I hope that goes very well for you, and be looking forward to seeing how. FreeSat develops over the next few weeks. And and Stuart, you too with Digital TV Europe. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having us. My next guest on the show is broadcaster, journalist and documentary film director, Gabriel Clark. Gabriel has been behind some of the best sports documentary films produced in the past few years, including The Edge, which I reckon is the best cricket film ever, and Bobby Robson, More Than a Manager. Before I chat with Gabriel, here's a clip from his new documentary film, Finding Jack Charlton. Ireland was engulfed in war and conflict. Nobody would have given you odds that we'd have an Englishman manage the team. Our way of playing is completely new. If you didn't like it, tough luck. My brother Jack was an uncompromising character. Jack said, if you don't get off the bus today, you'll never play for this country again. This is a time when it gives you the opportunity now, not only to go. Come on. You couldn't feel the spirit of the camp. What did it mean to lead Ireland to the World Cup finals? You're talking about financially. <laughs> it was an extraordinary adventure. I'm back in Lewis here. I'm going to win the World Cup. Another magnificent chapter in Jack Charlton's career. Welcome to the show, Gabriel. Hi, Justin. Nice to talk to you. First of all, congratulations on finding Jack Charlton. It's a superb documentary. And I think, like many of the other films you've been involved in, goes way beyond the sport and reveals something deeper about your subject as a person. Is is, is that something that you always strive to do? Yes. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and to answer your question, yes, most definitely is. I think it's it's one of the first rules, I think, of documentary making is to discover something new about your subject or, or at least to bring something new to the, the telling of the story that's not been done before. Because uh, often with these stories, the subject will have been investigated before or 
uh, had books written about him or her or the subject concerned. So I, absolutely, I think you always want to endeavor, whether it's new pictures, new archive, new interviews, uh, new information, new evidence, try and bring that to, to the story and, and uncover something. Uh, and of course, it can also just be in the way that you tell it or in the way in which your subject comes across, I think, or, or a particular angle towards that, that subject story, which has not been done before. In the case of Bobby Robson, the, the spine to the story was Barcelona uh, and this incredible story of his year there, which had never been told before. So uh, it's one of the, the, the sort of first pillars that I look for uh, when trying to discover what subject is really worth investing your time in. Finding Jack Charlton just went out on the BBC in the UK last week. What, what's been the reaction to it? It's been wonderful. It's been absolutely wonderful. And, and of all the documentaries that we've done, uh, it's certainly gained the most incredible response of all. I think it's the emotional power of the film. It certainly has struck people. And uh, we always felt that it had a, a level of emotional power that uh, we've not really worked with before. Um, but it's also struck people in a way, I think, that is authentic and genuine and uh, in, in relation to the subject of dementia. That was very important that um, you, you feel that you've done that particular storyline justice, but also uh, editorially you've done it in the correct way, you know, in a way which... Um, um, for, for those involved with that particular subject, is um, is comfortable. So that, that, that so, so that that was the, one of the first things that's really struck us. The response, I think, across many levels in in the world of football, but in the world of non football, non sports people, fans, just in terms of the story, and not having to have necessarily a connection before the film to Jack Charlton. Um, that that particular audience as well have, have loved the film. And, and of course, that's another ambition that you try to have is with your film to break out beyond its immediate audience. And I always felt that this story had that. We were hoping to have a big cinema release in November. Of course, that didn't happen. We had a big cinema release planned in Ireland and parts of the UK. It didn't happen. Um, so in, in a way, even though we had a, a really good premiere period across the platforms in November, the television premieres both in Ireland and then uh, in the UK across the BBC at prime time have really felt like the launch pad in many ways for the film. And so that, hence the response that we've had, which is which has been you know, unprecedented. So tell us about how the film originally came about. Have you been wanting to make a film about Jack Charlton for, for a while? I hadn't had Jack necessarily at the top of my list and I was doing other projects it would have been in the summer of 2018, so after the Football World Cup and we'd finished making the Bobby Robson film and I had a couple of other projects like The Edge that we were involved with. But um, I, I knew Jack from my time working at ITV. I knew that there was a lot of archive associated with Jack's story that existed and which hadn't necessarily been used and told. I didn't feel that Jack's story from a UK perspective, what he did with Ireland, an Englishman going to Ireland in the mid 80s at the peak of the troubles and his impact there had really been told from a UK perspective. And I talked to Andy Townsend, who I knew from ITV, about whether he shared that feeling he did. We thought, well, let's have a chat with um, Jack and Jack's son, John, who Andy knew from the, the, the time in the international team. And we went up, uh, it would have been sort of August, September 2018, and we met at John's pub and Jack came along. And it was clear at that point that uh, Jack wouldn't be doing interviews himself because he was living with dementia. And it wasn't immediate to me that we will now do a film about a, fo a former footballer living with dementia. But clearly that, that storyline would have to be told if we were going to do the film. And we decided, yes, we wanted to make the film. Uh, and we went from there. But it was based essentially to begin with around the impact that Jack had with the island team. And, and of course, a lot of the film is about that. It, it's about this astonishing impact that he had, told by the stories also of Paul McGrath and other players and people like uh, Larry Mullen from U2, Brendan O'Carroll, Roddy Doyle, the author, uh, authenticating that uh, incredible impact off the field at that time as Ireland manager 
under Jack Charlton that time had over the country. You originally met back in 2018. Was most of the film completed before COVID hit? Yes, most of it uh, fortunately was. We did some pickups in June 2020. Uh, so uh, just before Jack died, uh, we did some interviews at that point. Uh, but we went into edit in November 2019 for a first period of edit, which took about eight weeks. And we were originally going to launch the film, release the film around the European Championships of 2020. They were postponed. But even before they were postponed, when when COVID hit, we, we decided that we'd delay the film for three months. We had other things that we wanted to move forward with. And... And also there was around the film a sense as well, talking regularly with Jack's family, that um, he may well not, not live too much longer. So um, we were, we're having to sort of weigh up a few things. And, um, and then so we resumed our edit in July 2020 and finished it in September 2020. You mentioned dementia aspect of the story. And uh, there's also Jack's fractured relationship with his brother, Bobby as well, which I wasn't really aware of. Uh, how, how do you go around telling this side of Jack's story sensitively? Because, you know, that those two issues are, are very sensitive, obviously. Well, a lot of it is based around your research, so around what you find from the past. And obviously, it was very important that uh, with Jack not being able to uh, communicate directly that we we got as much archive of Jack across various interviews uh, that he'd done and, and Jack did so many interviews was involved in so many different types of television uh, was wonderful at it and very outspoken and very honest uh, so we sourced the interviews and in the case of the, the the Bobby and Jack story we obviously talked to Pat Charlton Jack's wife we talked to John Charlton Jack's son about that uh, that they, they were obviously willing to talk about that subject and and to put it in context really and and you you, you go from that base from, from someone who'd followed the story a little bit more closely it was always clear that um they were very different men they were very different as as characters their lives obviously were inter, intertwined through football but um they weren't necessarily that they, they shared the same blood but they were very different characters and and i think the film just follows that thread really um through through to the end through through to when jack died because obviously we, we we wanted to try and speak with with sir bobby as well and um we approached his wife norma and, and lady norma made it clear to us that uh, sir bobby wouldn't be able to speak because he himself is now living with dementia and and that news hadn't been publicly broken so the film was the first to to announce that news but there were there were lots of yeah very yeah, sensitive areas in their relationship, but also I think it's Pat Charlton who says in the film that not all families are close. You know, many many families do do grow apart, and that was the case with with Bobby and Jack in in various parts of their lives. Although in other parts of their lives they were very close. In the film, in one of Jack's quotes, he says that he had to look after Bobby when they were kids, and he didn't really enjoy it. That was something that obviously. As you say, the thread ran all the way through the lives when they were in the World Cup winning team together. Obviously, Bobby playing for Manchester United and, and Jack for Leeds, big rivals, Yorkshire Lancashire. I mean, there was ho so many sides of that story of them being on opposing sides, but being brothers was uh, was fascinating to me. Yes, and and you know, there's a sort of uh, biblical sense to it. I think uh, there's a, there's a you know, it's it's. So it's an it's an eternal theme. It, it cuts across so many families, that sort of thing, and I think people can I, identify with it. I think it was key for us, though, in the film, and certainly key for me, that um, as much as we needed to reflect elements of that story, that it wouldn't wouldn't be a, a Bobby Charlton documentary or a Bobby and Jack documentary. We we had to reflect that 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 part of their life, Jack's life, because elements of it defined his life. But but. I think so, hopefully with this film puts across just how much more Jack Charlton was and how much more, especially with Ireland, he achieved. I think as a as a a figure in his own right, because he was overshadowed during his playing career by his brother and, and, and accepted 
and always defended anyone who <laughs> who criticized his brother he would defend his brother to the hilt and his brother's talent but his actual achievement i think as a manager and player was huge in in its own right uh, obviously we discussed things like knighthoods at the end of the film as well i really hope that this film in that sense has enabled jack charlton's own legacy to be seen for the huge achievement that it is yeah and and you say that the impact that he had on a whole not only one nation but two actually and making films is is obviously a commercial business as well as a as an art form and Jack's such a legend in Ireland, but perhaps they didn't want to watch too much in the film about his World Cup triumph with England in 1966. And so how do you balance the storytelling so it also appeals to as wide an audience as possible? And particularly in this case, as you said, Jack took over as manager of, of the Irish team at a time that the troubles were, were really at their height. You know, to have an Englishman managing the national team was quite a big deal how do you put a film together that that tells a story for english fans but also for irish fans as well well i think that's been one of the key things about the feedback to the film is that it had a it, it had a huge impact in ireland uh, they, they've had documentaries based around jack before but essentially football based uh, obviously the living with dementia aspect the storyline with paul mcgrath the storyline with with Bobby, those were other threads that we added to it. Um, but one of the th things that most pleased me is that obviously this was um, a production that we did in association with Virgin Media in Ireland and with the BBC in the UK. Now, obviously, both of them, as you say, would want their own commercial audiences, their own audiences, given a sort of content. But I made it clear in the treatment that it, the, the Irish story was going to be at the heart of this. And this idea of an Englishman going to Ireland, which hadn't really been told from a UK perspective. So you have to make decisions in your storyline and stick by them. You're never going to be able to, especially with a, a, a life like Jack's, appeal to everybody. You're going to have to get rid of a Leeds United chapter that you, you, you know you have so much wonderful material on. You're not going to be able to do the England World Cup story necessarily full justice because... It's a documentary about Jack Charlton Ireland and, and many other themes that aren't necessarily football related. So you have to make those decisions. And in doing so, I think you have to therefore trust that the elements that you do have in your story are going to break out and are going to be strong enough in storytelling terms, in emotional terms, uh, to engage the audience, go beyond football, if you like. And so I think that hopefully the reaction to the film has told you that we, we were able to succeed in this case because of the power of the story overall, even if it was Ireland skewed, it was a very human story at heart and a story of success against the odds, a story of being your own man, a story of this incredible figure who comes from the outside to transform a nation, uh, which essentially he should be an alien to. How about other international sales? Is it being taken out for, for sales internationally right now? Yeah, it's, uh, we have our own. Uh, NOAA Media Group is the company that uh, I'm a director of with my colleagues, Barry Smith, uh, John McKenna, Torquil Jones. We set the company up uh, five years ago. Uh, we've gone from four co-founders to, to 30 people. And you, you mentioned The Edge, Bobby Robson, more than a manager. We've had television series uh, that have gone out on ITV and Channel 4 and now have two feature documentaries in production, three t television documentaries in production. And we also have to answer your question, an, an international sales department to ensure that we can get our films around the world to the, to the right sort of audience. So yeah, that, that's happening as we speak. Uh, there's obviously been a window for Jack on the platforms, Amazon, uh, Apple, Sky. It'll, it'll also be taken up once this option is finished with the, the BBC and Virgin. It'll be uh, it'll be going onto one of the platforms as well for for a second window. Coming back to Jack, I mean, he's it, what I found was it was remarkable how he assembled this squad of players, this band of outcasts almost, and brought them together to play for the Irish team. What did you learn about him as a man manager and his ability to motivate and stimulate this very varied bunch of characters? I learned uh, something that he wrote 
in the notes that we managed to get from the family, which I think sums it all up, which is be a dictator, but be a nice one, which is in the film. Jack wrote these notes, which we were able to um, use and uncover, which obviously as a documentary maker is, is manna from heaven. And um, it, it put into sharp perspective just what a sharp mind he had in relation to man management. It was his greatest strength. I think he talked to the players about that. He had his own very clear tactical ideas about how the game should be played and what would make this band of, band of mavericks successful. But um, at the heart of his man management was this ultimate and absolutely true belief in his own way of doing things. And to get the players on side, have a good time, have a laugh, but also be serious when we work was essentially the basis of that. So we do it my way, guys. You follow me. We'll have a great time. We'll be successful. If you don't want to do it my way, then um, you're not for me. Simple as that. And, and I think it, it boils down to that very simple quality of charisma and unfailing belief and straightforward philosophy that's a, that is at the heart of so many great leaders, not just managers, but leaders. I learned a lot about his leadership skills, to answer your question, how much he thought about leadership. It wasn't off the cuff. He'd thought about it. He'd written it down. He had his pillars and principles and was able to boil them down into simple phrases that uh, encapsulated uh, really strong and clever, intelligent uh, skills. How much do you think Don Revy influenced his management style? Greatly. Greatly. I mean, there's a, there's a note in the film that touches on that, uh, where he referred to Revy in his notes. Revy, in many ways, was ahead of his time with the Leeds United team. And Revy saw managerial qualities in Jack. It's not something we, we discussed in the film, but reading up in the background, Revy saw leadership skills in Jack. And, and Jack, as a player, wasn't really focused for much of his early playing career on being the best that he could be as a player. Obviously, he made his debut with England relatively late, but it was only thanks to Revy's intelligence and um, the managerial skills, tactical awareness, and, and willingness to share that with Jack, I think, and to see qualities and, and see the room for improvement in Jack, that Jack, Jack responded, first of all, to knuckle down as a player and then to think about coaching. And by the age of 26, 27, Jack was... Uh, on FA courses in the afternoon in Leeds or or, or travelling uh, around the Yorkshire area, coaching, doing his own coaching clinics and earning some money on the side and and developing as a coach. And a lot of that was down to Revy's encouragement. Hmm. I didn't know that. and But what I do know is obviously he... He made 762 appearances for Leeds. One club player. There's, you know, very, very few. We'll never see players like that again in terms of the, you know, dedication and impact on on one club, I think, for the whole career. Any chance of a director's cut for Leeds fans of the film? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, there was there's so much of a story there. I guess you're, you've been blessed with so many different strands that you can go with Jack's life. We've done some publicity with Leeds United TV, been wonderful, and um, the Yorkshire Post, and and so many of the Leeds United related outlets, Leeds United themselves, uh, were really good to us on social media when it when it was released last week. And absolutely, we could have done a much much greater chunk of the film around Jack and Leeds and Jack and Don Revy. And I know that his son John Charlton certainly would have liked a bit more Leeds in there. And uh, when Jack died last last summer, the tributes that were connected to Leeds United were many. We just had to make a decision. And, and Jack was one of 15, 16 wonderful players from that Leeds United era that in many ways changed the game, thanks to Don Revy and a uh, wonderful collection of players. But he was one of many great players, whereas obviously with the Ireland story, he was the leader of that, that great period. And so that, that was really... The, the reason for not having as much Leeds United in it. You know, there, there are certainly quite a few um, of the interviews where we discussed Jack at Leeds. His wife, Pat, talked about it and son, John. Um, so that there's a little bit more material there for you. And maybe we'll stick some out on the Finding Jack um, social media feeds 
in the uh, in the weeks and months to come because as I say the response from Leeds United supporters has been wonderful and I'm I'm so pleased that they're they're proud of Jack and and engaged in the story as well because it isn't simply just about Ireland it's about this incredible legacy as you say I mean he really was a leader uh, in that in that sense you know the, just you know for one man as a footballer to go and and really lift the hearts of a whole nation some of the comments from Larry Mullen and some of the other uh, contributors of the film just really, you know, underlined that for me. And actually, it was a really pivotal moment, wasn't it? It was the mo- it was the beginning almost of the an Irish national resurgence as well. So it it all sort of interlinked and and was you know it was really um, uh, you know showed what a, what an inspirational guy he was and what what an impact he had. Yeah, I mean, Jack Jack arrived in Ireland as a winner. He, he'd won the World Cup. He'd won things with Leeds United. He was a he was a household name even in Ireland. Uh, he was an Englishman they all knew, and his his attitude very much was, I think, that Ireland had an inferiority complex. Its footballers had an inferior inferiority complex, which may be symbolised uh, elements of the national consciousness. And so the the football team was able to be successful to transform a nation's sense of self-esteem and it, it's obviously indirect to the, the political change that then happened it's indirect to some of the economic change that then happened but but there are links there and and these were authenticated by the cast that you talk about there by Roddy Doyle by um, Bertie Ahern by those that were around at the time the football team and Jack's leadership was pivotal to a transformation in the national mood. Now, sports documentaries are, are really becoming much more sophisticated and multi-layered. And I think I'm, I'm probably talking about your documentaries as opposed to them as a whole. But what are the other subjects that you want to tackle in the future? There's a lot that you can't give away because you don't want anybody else to tell those stories. <laughs> but are there more sports subjects that you want to document going forward? There always are, yes, and we get quite a lot of people now uh, contacting us with with ideas. Uh, no media group, and that's that's wonderful. We've done well in a, in a financial sense, which is obviously crucial if you have to continue making them, and if people are to, want to come forward and continue in, investing in them. I, I think for for me personally, the, the content has to be to a degree areas which you're able, as I say, go back to where we started, where, where you're able to bring something new to the subject. I think there has to be an emotional power to the story that you're able to try and elicit. That's not always possible, but you have to feel, I think, an emotional connection to your subject. Uh, you also have two, I think, investigative elements are, are important. Uh, we did a documentary series, Out of Their Skin, a couple of years ago, pre-Black Lives Matter, um, pre the um, uh, sad and unfortunate decline in in the way in which um, racism has sort of returned to football. We did it just before that happened, and that was a very rewarding series to do because it tackled a subject which has been tackled very much since, but we you know it was something that I really wanted to do. I think um I think that's it. It's that combination of investigative and emotional. You know, and, and and sport offers a lot of territory for both those. And if you have both in in the same film, then that's even better. Or series, then that's even better. Yeah, surely a Marcelo Bielsa film has got to be on the cards. <laughs> I just don't think Bielsa really. Well, you've, you've had the lead series, haven't you? Yeah, you've had the lead. You've had the lead series. But he wasn't like involved that. in that, and and he, well, he, he think, had no interest in no, being involved in that. No, which is, well, I think that's the answer. I'm afraid, Justin, <laughs> is that Marcelo does not like a camera. Yeah, and you, 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 it, it always helps if you have a man who a woman who likes the camera, and, and Jack Charlton liked the camera, and yeah. that was one again one of the big reasons for coming in in the first place was knowing your archive base was there. And then, then knowing that potentially there's so much more that you're going to uncover, which which we did. Yeah, you know, we, we had footage in that that um, in Finding Jack, which came from the 1990 behind the scenes in the, in the hotel after they'd lost to Italy, which was extraordinary, which we managed to find. Yeah, and footage, footage of Jack doing after dinner speeches out in the middle of nowhere in Ireland and, and coaching kids, which just authenticated authenticated what an amazing time it was it wasn't so we're not just dealing in apocryphal anecdotes we're proving it on screen and that is 
absolutely essential for, if you're going to really move forward with a documentary project to, to know that that sort of material is out there uh, and to be tipped off that there might even be more that goes with it. And you've got to have a subject who wants to engage. And yeah, as much as I admire Marcelo Bielsa, don't think he's going to be that keen on talking about how wonderful he is. Yeah. Well, Gabriel, thank you for spending so much time with us. I won't be able to hear the song Blade and Races again without thinking of Jack. It was a really, really touching film. And we'll put a link to the iPlayer uh, way to access the the show within the episode description of the podcast. If you do get the chance to watch it, please do. I hope to speak to you again in the future sometime, Gabriel. Yes, keep in touch. Thanks, Justin. Well, we've reached the end of another week's show. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And don't forget to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed and exclusive insight and opinion, including the secret producer, our intrepid anonymous exec reporting from the front line of TV production. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in partial lockdown in London. Until next Thursday, as always, stay safe.